Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, we are happy to have Sean Kakaday here from Wharton. Uh, he is going to be talking about work that he did here, or at least started here in the fall with Elon and Hamid. And our Elon and Hamid is here. Where's Elon? He's uh, giving this talk actually at Duke. Oh, he's giving this talk at Duke. This talk has been, has been given a lot recently, yeah, huh? I think it's given, being given four times this week. <laughs> so um, we're going to see if the work merits as much attention <laughs> as it's getting. We all like it a lot. Uh, it's an optimal dynamic mechanism for multi-armed bandit processes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, thanks for having me back. And uh, thanks for the invite for the talk. It's, uh, uh, yeah, so this worked last fall. And it's been a lot of fun working with these characters, partly due to the confluence of ideas. Uh, because we both are from different back, we're all from different backgrounds, and we really uh, brought to the table a bunch of different techniques. Uh, okay, so, uh, so the multi-arm bandit problem is um, a very elegant framework for studying many stochastic optimization problems, and it's been receiving a lot of increasing attention in modern applications, including routing, medical experiments, interactive learning, and. The classic problem is as follows. So at each period, we as the decision makers will select uh, some arm. We'll then, uh, when we select the arm, we'll obtain some rewards stochastically. Oh, thanks. Sorry. All right. <laughs> all right, starting again. Uh, all right, that's annoying. OK, so at each period, we're going to select an arm, and we're going to obtain some reward. The, uh, each arm is going to be in some state, so we're denoting the states in this picture by the nodes, and the reward we get is going to be determined by this, the state we're in, and when we select an arm, the transition will depend, uh, the transition to the next chain will, will be dependent on the particular state we're in. So for example, uh, in this setting, if we select arm 2, we'll get this reward of $9, uh, and the star denotes the current state we're in in each arm, and after we pull the arm, we'll get the $9, and we have a 50-50 probability of transitioning to either of these two states. And in this particular set case, we'll transition to uh, that state. And our goal here is to maximize some notion of the long-term future rewards. Uh, and for this, for a particular notion of the long-term future rewards, uh, we have this really slick solution uh, from Gittins back in the 70s. Uh, and what's remarkable about it, it's this very simple like index-based policy. And what I mean by that is it's a policy where you can de decide which arm to pull purely based on a certain number uh, which you can compute uh, using the state of that arm. So what I, what I mean by this is like for this particular arm, we know it's in the state, you can compute one number, and then you pull the arm which has the highest index number. And this is a very appealing solution because naively, you wouldn't expect the solution to have such a simple form. You, Naively, the solution would be, you know, the arm you need to pull really depends on some, the joint state of all the arms, and the way you find it is some pathological computation. But instead, we have this uh, simple way of finding, of choosing the best arm, where we can choose it by pulling the arm with the highest number. Um, uh, we assume that the inside this box, we know the transition probabilities. Okay, so um, that's right, that's right. We just don't know uh, the optimal policy, and clearly we can you know, compute this with some really horrendous dynamic programming with this gigantic table of what to do with every cross-product state. But the point is, uh, this kind of really elegant result by Gittins shows that we don't need to represent it this way. We can just compute this one single number for each arm and then pull the arm. Uh, yeah, that's right. You keep... Uh, Yeah, that's right. And then I wouldn't really, when I pull the arm, I don't know which transition I've made. Is that uh, but you, we, we know which state we're in. So we that assume that in each moment we know the state. That's right. The state is observable. That's right. That's right. Um, 
Right. So in a sense, what Gittins is solving is a very clean way of doing the dynamic programming in the setting where we know the state we're in uh, and we know the transition model. So it's kind of this biz setting. Um, and it provides this. And it's received a ton of study in the operations uh, research community and statistics community uh, because it's, it's really kind of a magical framework. But one of the problems with it, you know, while this has been receiving a lot of attention in modern applications, this framework isn't taking incentives in, into account. So let's take an example where incentives are important from online ad auctions. So say Bing has uh, an ad space to sell. And hypothetically, say someone for some odd reason wants to buy a car, they go to Bing, they type car uh, into the search bar, and now Microsoft is faced with a decision as to which, ad, uh, which car ad to display. And let's say it's choosing among uh, these three major car companies, uh, and now it, it's going to decide which, uh, which car companies add to display. And we can think about modeling this problem as a multi arm bandit problem, where the pull of the arm corresponds to uh, which car companies add we're going to display. And now let's look at uh, a possible sequence of events when we pull a particular uh, when we pull a particular arm. So say for example we display uh, Chrysler's ad. Uh, it's displayed in the top uh, part of the, uh, the, the web page here. Now the one event that can occur is the person going to click on the ad or not. Uh, say they click on, on the ad. And the next thing event we might be interested in is, is not just whether or not uh, the person clicks on the ad, we want to know if the, that click leads to some purchase of a car. So, so the person clicks on the ad, they go to the web page, they're at the web page, and now does a purchase occur on that web page for the car? Let's say it's an internet purchase for the car. And uh, as far as uh, Chrysler is concerned, it's they care about knowing the probability that a click will lead to a purchase because they're interested in how much they should spend on displaying the ad, and that is related to how much they're going to make uh, when they place the ad. And in this setting, the reason we think about this as a bandit setting is we think about the state as capturing the knowledge, our current knowledge, of the click and purchase rates. So when we pull the arm, we're getting knowledge. Uh, we display this ad, and we see some information, and the state is capturing our current state of knowledge about what happens when we place the Chrysler, uh, the, w what happens when we place this ad. So in particular, these, um, the click and purchase rates can be learned over time as we repeatedly pull the arms, uh, and they also could evolve over time. Um, so with the state, I'm a little confused about like, so the state, if, we sh if we're going to show the ad to multiple different people, is that like the first poll is when I show it to the first person? Yeah, that's right. So you can think about uh, the state as something like the capturing the sufficient statistics. So like in, the, like in a vanilla coin flip model where you have stochastic rewards in the Gittins problem, the way you'd consider the state would be some sufficient statistics as to what's happened when you pull that arm. But, but I think uh, what he's asking is in the context of this, every time someone searches for the word car, you pull an arm or not. Yeah. That's right. Every time the, you, the person search, searches for a car, you get to decide uh, which one to display, and the state's going to capture the sufficient statistics. Uh, You find out uh, whether a click occurs, whether a purchase uh, occurs. Okay, that, that's what's being revealed, but, but the issue now is who's it being revealed to? Okay, so, I'm ask you a so, yep. Can I think of it as follows? You have, so you have some unknown probability, but if I had, if I had made these experiments many times, exactly. I would learn the click through rate. That's exactly and right. My that's exactly right. state is actually in codes the my car knowledge of exact, that's exactly right. That's, that's exactly how you think the classical bandit problem. That's so it's sort of like, like when you have a preferential attachment, or so you can think of it as a polya urn with an unknown probability, or you can think of it, you have collected so many balls here. That's exactly right. You might have some prior as to what the rate is, and as you pull the arm each time, you're getting more information. Uh, that's right. Right. And this is exactly analogous to the slot machine. It's evolving along a certain path given what you did. That's right. That's right. Is there, is this thing, I mean, so it seems like it's quite posterior, right? But is That's there, right. Is, it, is there a truth then? There is a truth so, so let me give you this slide and I'll exactly answer that question. Um, so this is just the motivation, but we'll, you'll see this in the model. So from I's value for the displayed ad at time t, we can write the value for the ad is the chance that the display results in a click times the chance that the click results in a purchase times the expected profit that occurs uh, when when a purchase occurs. So that's the value. And these purchase and click-through rates, we can think about as the posterior estimates 
of what these rates are, given what's occurred the previous times we pulled this arm. Um, so, and, and what the key issue is, the firm knows these, uh, you know, the, the key issue is the car companies are strategic, and they don't necessarily want to divulge this information to the search engine. In particular, uh, the profits and sales data are private information, so, it's the, so really the, the car companies, uh, only they know the, the probability of a purchase, and only they know uh, the purchase per sale. So in the vanilla uh, multi-arm band setting, this information is public knowledge because we see what happens every time we pull the arm. In the setting with in where incentives are involved, we don't necessarily see these outcomes. And we might like the, mecha the mechanism might ask people to, to, to tell uh, them the outcome, but there's no reason people should be honest because the car companies obviously uh, want to act in their best interests. And in this work, what we're interested in is uh, an incentive compatible mechanism that maximizes the search engine's long term revenue. So, in particular, we're interested in the question of uh, this classical question of maximizing our revenue, but we're going to assume that the agents are behaving in a strategic manner. So, we have to take into account their strategic considerations uh, when we're solving this problem. The word okay. Bayesian only appears in the, middle, in the middle. So, it's Bayesian incentive compatible or it's both? No, it's, it's Bayesian. I, I just really mean. Uh, Bayes optimal, and the notion of incentive compatible is Bayesian as well. We'll define that precisely later on, but we're in a setting where there is a, there is a prior, um, and the notion really is Bayes optimal. Uh, and that's the same setting of Gittins, where it really is this Bayes optimal Bayes solution. optimal for the car company, or it's uh, Bayes optimal for maximizing my revenue? So, uh, both. So, so, the incentive considerations are going to be, all the agents are going to be acting in their best interest in a Bayes optimal sense. And, and we're assuming that. And subject to that constraint, we want to maximize our revenue Again, in expectation. Uh, in, in expectation. All right. So that's the motivation. And I'll define that precisely. But that is the problem. And uh, we're going to try to solve this in a more general setting. But this is the application we're going to have in mind throughout the talk. OK, so uh, the outline is as follows. First, we're going to uh, do a quick overview of mechanism design, both uh, with regards to two differing objectives and uh, namely maximizing social welfare and optimality. And then we're going to look at uh, an, a review of Meyerson's seminal result for how to do optimal mechanism design, uh, because I think many of you aren't familiar with that, but it's really a beautiful result. Uh, then we're going to set up our problem in the bandit setting in the dynamic case. Uh, the second part is we're going to try to figure out how to approach this problem. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to try to write down, this is an optimization problem, so we're going to try to write down a mathematical program to solve it. Uh, but the difficulty in writing in the mathematical program is how the heck do we write down these constraints to capture incentive compatibility? And when we do that, we're going to see it's actually easier to write down relaxed, a re relaxation of this program. Uh, and, and now we want to understand when does this relaxation approach work to finding the optimal solution. And we'll show that, in fact, we can provide an optimal solution in a particular setting using uh, a kind of merge of this Gittins idea and some ideas from optimal mechanism design theory. OK, so let's uh, look at the two possible objectives we could have in mechanism design. Uh, the first one is the notion of efficiency. This isn't going to be the one we're, we're going to be directly concerned with, but I should, uh, but it is closely related. So let's start with this. So the notion of efficiency is that we'd like to maximize the social welfare of the system, and where the social welfare is the sum of all the agent's values. So in the static setting, what I mean by the static setting is the case where we just have one time period. Uh, here we have the classic VCG mechanism that, that does this. And uh, the basic idea of this mechanism is to charge, so, so we'd like to maximize the sum total value. And the way we do this is we basically consider what's known as the externality cost some agent imposes on the system. So we look at what would happen if the agent wasn't there. Uh, for example, You've heard of second price auctions. These are VCG mechanisms, because these are me mechanisms where uh, a person's truthful, but you have to charge them the second price for them to be truthful. Uh, provide, actually, even if there's many, uh, many people. If, if you have one item to allocate, uh, you could, everyone can bid, and you give it to the right. That's right, that's right. And actually, this is a good point, in, in that um, VCG is kind of amazing, in that it actually generalizes to the case of multiple items very, very nicely. And it just kind of. I mean, it's an amazing result. Even though it's so simple, it kind of works very generally. And what's very uh, cool about this is it actually works when we go to the dynamic setting. So uh, 
in the dynamic problem here, we might be interested in maximizing some notion of the long-term social welfare. And here we have this uh, really nice extension uh, to the dynamic setting by two different groups. So we have uh, you know, these computer science machine learning people here who did this work independently, uh, David Parks and Satinder Singh, who really have a very good knowledge of uh, kind of dynamic programming te techniques. And we also have uh, kind of these ideas discovered independently by Bergman and Valamaki. So Bergman gave the, the talk uh, last week. Seven years later. Uh, well, economics papers are funny because there are these are, it's, the date seems to be completely uncorrelated as to when <laughs> the work is done because the you know, drafts in progress. So, uh, uh, Right, right. So this was like a NIPS paper, right? But this was a NIPS paper. But, but I will say the focus on these two is different. Uh, but how do you people read it, period. Judging by <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're published. Oh. All right, all right, all right. Uh, You're in good uh, form. You are putting in now the, the, the best in the... Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. No, no, I, I have more to come. <laughs> uh, so what's really awesome about this result, um, it really combines two great ideas in a very natural way. So the VCG idea is the way we need to charge is we charge based on these ideas of externality costs. And we just basically combine this with the dynamic programming idea. Because in the, in the dynamic case, uh, you don't want to consider immediate externality costs. You need to consider some notion of future externality costs. And you can just combine them, and uh, it works out. Now, uh, this notion of maximizing social welfare is, is all fine and good, but it's not really the most uh, natural. I mean, it's not a particularly capitalist aspiration. Uh, and that really uh, brings us uh, to the second objective, which is that of optimality. And here... Wait, wait, I mean, maybe I've just been um, hang, hanging around economists too long, but they would tell me that maximizing social welfare in the end will generate more, you know, it'll generate a bigger pie from which my piece will still be bigger than, I mean, no? Certainly, I'm not going to get into that argu okay. argument, uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. and even just the notion of social welfare is a little tricky, because it's like, <laughs> what exactly do you sum? How do you weight people? Uh, but the no notion of optimality is far more well-defined, which is, I'm the mechanism, I want to maximize my take. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the problem we're going to be looking at today. And in the static setting, this is a far more challenging problem. And really only special cases have been solved, and uh, perhaps the most important special case is the original result by Meyerson, uh, which is selling one item uh, plus some caveat assumptions for when it works, but uh, it's really a remarkable result, and he got the Nobel Prize for it like two years ago. Now, in the dynamic setting, uh, we're interested in maximizing our long-term revenue, and, there, and for this problem, there's actually been uh, quite a lot of recent work. Uh, most of the work can only address some very restricted sp special cases. Now, b to be fair, uh, the focus of these papers often are on s slightly different things. So this Essocentes paper was really more on a notion of information rent. And this particular Pavan Segal and, and Torka paper was really interested in characterizing a lot of the constraints that IC imposes on the system. And that was more of their focus. Uh, but when, I, when you actually looked at which settings they can handle, uh, they're really very limited. And they're not applicable, applicable to problems like sponsored search, because they can't really ha handle uh, more general types of experience. They are really limited to settings where the, the signals you're getting are continuous signals, as opposed to these discrete click events and discrete purchase events. Uh, and the types of value functions you can use are also very, very constrained. Um, and they don't really focus on algorithmic considerations either. So our focus here is, again, on the second ob objective of revenue maximization in a dynamic setting. OK, so uh, now let's go back and quickly re review Meyerson's result, because some of you aren't familiar with it. And it's a really uh, remarkable result, because it's it just, just the way it worked out. So we're in the static case now. Uh, each agent i values the item at some uh, real number theta i. We call this the type. Uh, so there's no dynamics here. And 
we're assuming that the types are private information to the agent, but they're generated from some known distribution fi. So, so what happens is when we start the system, everyone gets a sample of their type, uh, and what the mechanism knows is the distribution, but not their particular type. And the goal here is to maximize the expected revenue subject to the agents behaving strategically. OK, so here, ignoring incentives, uh, we could just allocate to the highest person who has the highest value and charge them theta i. Of course, this isn't going to work because they're not going to reveal their type. So when we take incentives into account, uh, we, we have even this, the, the first question we face is how the heck do we even allocate? Let alone forgetting about charging, how do we even allocate to, maxim, uh, to maximize our expected revenue? And uh, Myerson addresses both of these problems, how to allocate and how to charge. And let's just look at a solution for how we allocate. So the way we allocate is we actually allocate to the bidder with the highest positive virtual value, where the virtual value, value is this definition, where uh, theta i is the value, and you subtract off some sort of penalty function of theta i, which is known as the inverse hazard rate. I'm not going to go into the details of this function, but this function is constructed with knowledge of this distribution. And, uh, but I don't know theta i. You don't know theta i. So I don't uh, know the value, so I can still not allocate. No, no. So, so this is the allocation we want to implement. Now, we still need to set up a pricing scheme uh, such that we can implement this allocation. So we'll get that in the next slide. But the actual allocation uh, that we need to use uh, should behave according to this function. Uh, and, and whereas the VCG setting, we know the allocation we want to use, which is we're maximizing the social welfare. Here, uh, it, this, this is telling you the allocation you want to use, and you have to figure out how to price it. So the next example uh, will make that clear. What's kind of remarkable about this solution, I mean, it, it's amazing in a number of ways, but what really stands out is how simple it is. It's an, again, it's an index-based solution. So what you do is you just compute this value separately for each person and give it to the person who's, where this value is the highest. So there's kind of no uh, interactions between them. It's just You just summarize this one number and give it to the person who has the highest virtual value. Uh, and it just kind of remarkably falls out of this uh, his proof. Uh, well, Gittins, somehow, you know, you have all these different ways of proving it, uh, and there's like these duality-based proofs, and, you know, eventually, I think John Sickles came along and killed it with this, like, really elegant proof. Uh, but here, Myerson's original proof, I mean, it's just clean, and uh, it, it showed you. Block. Yeah, right, that's right. I mean, even now, just go back and read the original paper. Like, uh, it's, it's a very clean book, and it shows a nice decomposition, but it's, uh, yeah, it just uses some calculus and magic. And, it works. So, so let's get some intuition by looking at this, um, uh, by looking at a simple example here. Uh, so we're going to have one agent with theta coming from the uniform distribution. The efficient allocation is we're maximizing social welfare, so you always give it to him. If you always give it the item to someone, you need to charge them zero, and there's no revenue here. Uh, but let's look at what the optimal allocation is, which is the allocation which will maximize the revenue. For this particular case, you can work out this function phi, and it just turns out to be 1 minus theta. I'm not, not telling you where you get it from. But you just work it out. You get 1 minus theta. And the allocation rule is you're going to allocate if the virtual value is positive. Uh, and if you work out what the virtual value is, uh, you allocate when 1 minus 2 theta is greater than 0. And solving for that means you want to allocate whenever theta is greater than a half. And now we're going to get back to Christian's question, because uh, this is the allocation we want to implement. We want to only allocate when the person's value is greater than a half. So how do we charge to get this allocation to occur? How do we char so this is the allocation we want. How do we charge? Charge a half. So uh, we say, if you, if you bid something greater than a half, I charge you a half. If you bid something less than a half, uh, you don't get the item and you pay nothing. So we offer the item at price a half. They're going to be truthful. Uh, and and this is how we implement this, uh, this, this mechanism. And in this particular case, you'll see there's a 50% chance of selling the item because they have to, the value has to be above a half. And we also get an optimal revenue of a quarter. So in this particular case, we see the optimal revenue is a quarter. And the point is, we're, it's this really distributional notion of optimality, which is why this is subtle. We have to take into account this distribution somehow. But magically, it works out with Myerson, and we can handle you know, multiple uh, buyers in, in a similar sort of way. OK, so now let's go to 
uh, the outline. The index only works if the distributions of the different agents are independent. That's right. That's right. The right. That's <laughs> the, the, so, so not the distribution. The samples are independent. So, so when you have correlated types, yeah, it's. But I think there's some new results and becomes very fast and be complete. I, I think it's there's even questions as to how you figure out what the optimal. I, I don't know what. Okay, I, I, I don't know what, what the results are there. I, even slightly correlated? This is a result yeah. that Meyerson alludes to in his original paper and is proved in uh, Crummer and McQueen. I see. So this is some equilibrium trick yeah, or something that's there. Yeah, basically you use uh, you use the correlation to, to create lotteries for each okay. guy and you sell each person a lottery and you cross check okay. basically using the other guy's report. Mm. Okay. And you extract full surplus. Okay. Any any correlation. So, so as long as they're not mm -hmm. independent, you extract. Okay. In the Meyerson thing, is yeah. it is it very simple though? Like you know, you say, oh, okay, you know. So the per the one person is very simple. Like you do pay half. Right. The other mid cost half. Right. If you have a bunch of people, is it that simple? Like Jennifer has her price if she wants to buy, it, or everyone has their own price. Or it, basically, what happens is you know you you still going to charge potentially based on what other people bid, but the way you allocate. Uh, is you just give it to the person with the highest virtue valuation. Okay. But the charging could depend on what other people bid, but it's still a simple way to charge. Okay. Um, because you know, with enough buyers it, it, and the same distribution, it'll end up acting a lot like VCG. Uh, but, in this, this, but in general, it is not the same as VCG as we just saw. Okay, so here's the banner setting. We want to extend this to a setting uh, that's dynamic. So instead of one item being allocated, uh, we're going to have one item being allocated every round. Uh, at the first round, we're going to have this initial type theta i, which is sampled from some distribution. Uh, and in the ad auction case, we're thinking about this in initial type as the profit we get from a sale. And then at all subsequent rounds, we're going to have uh, the experience the agent ha has as they're getting the item. Uh, each time they get the item, they have some experience uh, with the item. So this is. Uh, so the here's the advertiser who's learning that's right. There. That's right. Each each advertiser is an agent, and they're learning things about it, uh, and they're learning their click through it. So this is addressing uh, Greg's question that uh, we think about this experience, which they have at every subsequent time step, as some summary statistics of their current uh, clicks and purchases, uh, and and in particular, at any given round, their value is going to depend both on theta i and the current experience. So in the ad auction case. The value is theta times the click-through rate times the purchase rate, where these are functions of their experience. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a banded problem in the sense that if we allocate to someone, uh, their experience will evolve in a Markovian manner, but no one else's experience will evolve. But should mm -hmm. I think of, I mean, there's sort of, we assume somewhere in the background there exists <coughs> some objective click-through rate for... That's right. So that's right. It's not known. Uh, this is sort of my Bayesian prior given the past history. That's right. See, so, so in one formalization, uh, we can think about this click-through rate as the estimate, the, the mean click-through rate given the history of observations under this Bayesian model. Oh, so it's just the empirical probability? Uh, well, you could have a prior, uh, so it would, not be, uh, it would not be that. It would be adjusted based on your prior because it's a full Bayesian model. Could it, the truth could itself be the, 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 the truth right? could, in fact, be drifting as well. Yeah. Uh, that's right. That's right. Uh, okay. So, uh, and here the theta and private experience are really uh, what we call signals to the agent. They aren't public. They aren't observed by everyone. Whereas the public experience, like the, whether or not the click occurs, is observed by the mechanism. So you could have some types of experience that are observed by the mechanism, some that are private. Okay. So that's the setting. I actually, I don't understand this question before. If the truth could be varying. Yep. Then I need some prior information on that. For example, is I, if I knew it doesn't vary, then my estimate given the past experience will be different. That's from right. If I can assume it varies arbitrarily. That's right. So, so, so what is uh, right? So sorry. So so what's known here uh, to the mechanism is the Markov process. It's like it's just like the the classical Giddens problem where we know the Markov process, uh, but we don't know. Uh, in this setting, the mechanism isn't going to know certain signals. Uh, so so I, I know there is some object get click through it at time 
i for for i. That could be times one. Un that's right. Unknown. That's right. I know that at time t plus one, it's a it's sort of given by some probabilities depending maybe on clicks and so exactly. on. Exactly. Of the previous step. That's right. That's right. And and I estimate all of these given the previous experience I have. So that's right. And you have a Bayesian. Uh, chain which gives me that's right. That's right. Um, it's just like the classic Gittins one, but you can only do that here if the agents were telling the truth about what happens. Right. Okay, so uh, so I'll quickly go through uh, the notion of what it means to be strategic. So at each time, agents report their type experience. The mechanism is going to allocate, and agents are going to make some payment, and they're going to have the instantaneous some instantaneous utility. And the instantaneous utility is just the difference between the value they obtain during that round and the price they pay. Okay. And uh, agents have reporting strategies based on their knowledge, which is uh, I have a history, I make some report uh, based, on the, based on my current state of knowledge. Uh, we have the, a notion of a future utility, which is just the, the sum of all utilities discounted in, into the infinite horizon. And once we have this notion of future uh, utility, we can define notions of uh, what it means to be strategic. So the notion of incentive compatibility here is that for each agent, uh, we want the truthful strategy to, to be a best response when other agents are behaving truthfully. Okay, and this is with respect to their future incentives. Uh, and we also have the notion of individual rationality, which is that we don't want any agent to be able to improve the utility uh, if they choose not to participate in the auction. So this is just the constraint that I want to be able to walk away from the system at any point in time. Like the mechanism says, hey, give me $100 for nothing, I'm going to say goodbye. So both, we want both of these to hold. So, so this is, uh, yeah, that's right, that's right. This is not, that's right. This is a kind of a Bayesian notion that I have some strategy at, at what I'm going to do is ask myself. Uh, actually have to pay and another one get money. So but, but it's at any, but, but the notion of individual rationality, uh, you're, you're taking into account all your future incentives. So certainly at a given round, uh, it might not hold, but you're not interested in what happens at a given round because if, if you get some utility for that in the future. Um, OK. And the revenue of the mechanism is just the discounted sum of the prices, uh, where it's just the discounted sum of the prices paid by each agent, uh, summed over the agents, and summed over the time. And now we can define an optimal mechanism, is it's the mechanism which maximizes the revenue among all IC and IR mechanisms. So it's an IC and IR mechanism, and it's maximizing the revenue among all of the uh, IC and IR mechanisms. And our main result here is going to be uh, an optimal mechanism for a natural class of bandit pro pro processes, including uh, a particular model for sponsored search. Uh, and the idea here is, again, to try to utilize uh, these two ideas of Giddens indices and virtual values. And in a sense, uh, you know, Hamid came to me, and he's like, oh, here's this problem. It seems really interesting. Uh, you understand some learning aspects of it. Uh, you know, he's worked on something similar. Why don't we think about this? And kind of after a cursory inspection, you know, under the typical academic bravado, we're like, oh, this has to be easy. Just combine these two ideas, and it should work. And then uh, we realized it's a lot more detailed, because Myerson, somehow Myerson, uh, just generalizing it to more than one item becomes very, very tricky, known as the multidimensional problem. But the basic idea when we started was we kind of knew the answer we wanted, which was kind of the analog of the VCG result to the optimality setting. Uh, but it turned out to be a more a delicate problem. OK. So. So now let's think about how we can attack this problem. So I've set the problem up. You have a little background from Myerson. Uh, now we want to address this problem. And uh, what we want to do is somehow, it's an optimization problem. So it's natural to try to set up some mathematical program where the solution to this program is what we want. Uh, it turns out uh, this is tricky because we don't have a very good understanding of how to write down these constraints in a natural manner for the general dynamic problem. But we do have a very good understanding of this, what happens for static mechanism design, uh, in the sense where if there's uh, really just one signal, we have a good idea of how to characterize constraints. So the qu the qu one question to ask is, how can we utilize these, our knowledge of the static case? Uh, and in particular, can we find a way to turn this dynamic setting into a, statics, uh, into a static one, and then utilize our knowledge for in the static case? So this brings us to this idea of a complete monitoring environment. So the simplest way uh, 
to relate this to a static problem is let's just ignore all the incentive considerations into the future. So let's just assume that all of the private experience the agents are getting are public. So, so uh, because right now, you know, these, these, um, the purchase events in the Clicker model, uh, only the car companies are observing that. But let's just say these were observed by the mechanism. So the only piece of, of private information is the first signal. Okay, and the rest we're gonna assume uh, is public. Okay, so now we have a problem where there's only one signal, the first signal, which is private, and everything else is observed. And now we don't have uh, these kind of dynamic incentives in the picture. So we have this, uh, th this is kind of trivial observation, which is that uh, any IC and IR dynamic mechanism is also going to be IC and IR in the complete monitoring environment. And this is kind of trivial because any deviation strategy we can use in the dynamic, uh, in the complete monitoring setting, uh, we can actually use in the dynamic setting. So, uh, so, so just kind of a, a minor observation, but it, but it shows uh, what it's going to allow us to do is, uh, is the following. So let's say, let's let R star be the optimal revenue in this complete monitoring environment. Uh, what that kind of trivial observation allows us to say is that the set of achievable revenues in the complete monitoring environment contains all the revenues from the da dynamic setting because we've just relaxed a constraint and we uh, have a larger set of revenues. And another trivial observation is, let's just say we happen to have found a mechanism that's IC and IR and happens to achieve R star in the dynamic environment, then this sucker is optimal for both the dynamic and the complete monitoring environment because, uh, uh, right, because all the revenues we can obtain in the dynamic setting are in the complete monitoring setting. And this suggests a natural relaxation approach to this problem, because what we're basically doing is we're gonna drop these dynamic IC constraints and consider an optimization problem for the complete monitoring setting. But keep IR uh, So let's not worry about, because IR constraints are typically easy uh, to, to get. I mean, if you do things right, uh, for the most part, IC is the, the hard yeah, part here. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so uh, so we're really thinking about this relaxed, uh, relaxed program now where we're going to try to solve this optimization problem uh, using only these constraints we're getting in this complete monitoring setting. When you say it's a mechanism for IC, you mean IC in which of the two environments? Uh, so, right, good. So in this setting, uh, I say if the mechanism is IC, IR in the dynamic environment. Oh, the whole thing is in the dynamic environment. Uh, Yes. Right. If, if it's IC, IR, and achieves R star in the dynamic environment, then the sucker is optimal in the dynamic and the complete monitoring environments just by this kind of trivial observation. Um, so it's kind of a, it's really trivial, but it gives us a way to start using uh, what we know from the dynamic setting. Uh, but let's think about this a little more and see what the implications are, because they're a little uh, surprising. Uh, and we didn't realize this, this is what we were doing at first, and it's kind of only after the fact we realized this is what was going on. So let's think about how we might uh, use this relaxation approach. So the first thing we're gonna do is let's find this optimal allocation Q in the complete monitoring environment. And uh, here we have uh, this nice body of work from uh, Milgram and Segal uh, on incentive compatibility constraints uh, in essentially when there's one signal. So these are these envelope theorems. Uh, and we can just find this Q using the static theory because we have these IC constraints. Uh, we can just write them down and solve this mathematical program to find uh, the Q, which we think is the, the best allocation in the complete monitoring environment. Uh, and that directly follows uh, using these guys' work. So it's interesting, Paul Milgram was going to speak today, but he couldn't make it. So this is one of his many, many uh, you're, results. You're probably doing uh, on his work. So, uh, I mean, in explaining it. So. so uh, so we can find this Q basically on static theory because we know, uh, we know these constraints. But now the question is, we found this conjectured Q, how do we make it work? So what about payments? So in the complete monitoring setting, payments are kind of easy because we only have to incentivize the agents to reveal theta because everything else is assumed to be uh, known. So, and we have a, basically the theory from these guys already tells us how to, uh, how to make payments. And so, so we really only have to incentivize them to reveal this one piece of information, and we can basically charge them right after they reveal that one piece of information for the future. 
But the payment scheme here is easy. But in the dynamic case, here's where the difficulty comes in. Because when we did this relaxation, we didn't consider the future signals. So in the dynamic case, we, when we figure out the payments, we need to figure out how to incentivize them to reveal both data and their private experience. So we still want to implement the same allocation. But now the problem is, how do we come up with payments to implement this allocation? Because now we have to somehow make the payment scheme such they're honest about these, these private experiences as well. And we didn't have to consider that at all in this complete monitoring setting. Um, so the question is, can we find a payment scheme uh, that makes Q, I, C, and I, R? Uh, and to do that, it means we really have to incentivize them to reveal their private experiences. And in particular, let's say we could do that. So we have this candidate Q. And let's say we happen to be able to find a payment scheme uh, that makes them that implements Q and makes them reveal their private experience truthfully. If that's the case, uh, we can sh show that this R star is achievable and Q is optimal, and then we're done. It's kind of easy. But what's kind of interesting about this approach is that if it happens to work out, uh, we actually will have the case that no revenue is being lost when we're incentivizing the agents to reveal their private experiences. So this is a concept known as information rent. So typically, when uh, agents have uh, private types, you can't extract as much revenue out of the system because uh, like in the, in the one period case, if I knew a person's value, I just charge them the value. So what's happening here is we're assuming, we're looking at a, a setting where these private experiences aren't actually private. We're figuring out how to charge them. And if this program is going to work out, it has to be the case that we're not losing any revenue uh, when, we, uh, when we actually make them truthfully report their, their experience. And, and in the, the lingo, we'd say the mechanism isn't paying information rent to the agents uh, to have them reveal this private information. Um, so, it's a so in a sense, it's a little surprising that this could work out because... Uh, Wait, now, what is making that true? I, I somehow missed the last explanation. If so you could do this... Oh, so, so right, so... so uh, no, I know that you haven't proved the... The, the if. I mean, I understand that the if is the hard part, but I'm... Oh, right. Okay, so the intuition... The right. So, so the question is, why could it even be possible? Right. Uh, so, the, so the intuition is, uh, these are future signals, and, the, and the, mechan the mechanism essentially has something like a first mover advantage, because it can actually charge them before they get their future signal. So for example, say in the one period setting, I got to charge you before you saw theta. I charge you a half. Right? If I let you get theta, I can no longer charge you a half, and then you get the expected revenue of a quarter, because some of the time you don't allocate. But here, uh, you get to, the mechanism actually gets to charge uh, before information is revealed. It can't charge before theta is revealed, because this is something they come to the table with, but it can charge before information is revealed. Uh, that's right. So it's kind of like a first mover advantage that the mechanism has. Uh, and that's kind of intuitively why, it's, uh, why it could be even possible. But Naively, we might not think it's possible. I mean, you charge beforehand by buying the firm. What? Not necessarily. So, so you still, you can charge more at the beginning, but that, that's just the intuition, because you're still going to be ch charging later. I mean, because the point is, you aren't just charging them for their utility at this round. Like, I'm going to say, pay me $100, and I'm going to do this. All right, so... So I still might have to charge you later on, too, because I have to in incentivize you uh, to, re to reveal things truthfully. Right? So in the complete monitoring setting, you can actually charge everyone up front in expectation. Here you can't, because if I charge everyone up front, you're, you're not going to be truthful anymore. You're going to be, oh, I love this item at day 100. So it's this kind of delicate balance between how to break up the charges, uh, but you somehow need to figure out a way such that you actually don't lose any money uh, when you uh, incentivize them to reveal their experiences. Okay, so in particular, uh, the question we're asking is, could this relaxation approach work in general? Uh, meaning, is it the case that the optimal dynamic revenue is always going to equal the optimal complete monitoring revenue? Which is a little surprising, because you would expect uh, it to be less in general. And it turns out this isn't true always. Okay, so uh, and we have a couple of examples here showing it's not true always. Um, maybe I'll... Actually, okay, so I'll briefly uh, describe this, see if it works. Um, but it shows that we can expect this approach to work all the time. 
And the idea is, let's consider uh, a particular si setting where we have um, only one item now, and it's going to be allocated at the second time step. So assume all the other items have zero value. So there's really only one item. It's allocated at the second time step. And your value of this item is, the second ex is, is completely determined by the second experience. Okay? So in the complete monitoring setting, the second experience is known. We charge the value. Right? So, but now in the dynamic setting, what I'm going to do is I'm going to correlate the first signal with the second signal. And in that case, it'll always be the case that the optimal revenue is less. And the way to see this is that every point in time, both time period one and time period two, the mechanism has less information about the value of the item than the agent. See, if we didn't have this correlated signal uh, theta at the beginning, we could do exactly my answer to, to Jennifer's question, which is, uh, I just charge you the expected value of E2. Right? Because uh, right, if the value is, like in my understanding, if I could charge you before you got theta, I would just charge you a half. But the point is, we have the signal at the time step one that's correlated with time step two, and this prevents you, uh, th and this means the dynamic setting, you can't ex extract the entire information. Uh, and it basically shows that we can't possibly expect this relaxed program to work in general. Um, so, and, and we're actually examining a lot of other cases, trying to get a feel of when we can expect this idea to work. Because somehow all of the proof techniques are really based on what's eff what effectively these envelope theorems. And they're implicitly uh, derived in this complete monitoring setting. So we're really trying to understand when it breaks. Uh, but also understanding when it breaks, uh, you know, we, ask, we have the question, you know, can we salvage this approach? And what hope do we have for this relaxation approach? Yeah. Sorry. I guess now I'm thinking about this problem slightly differently. I want to understand the complete monitoring solution. So in the complete monitoring environment, I can start with, I could in principle just charge you an amount of money at period zero. No, because, because uh, theta is, so we don't, it, it's like in my sense result, you could say you can charge them before they got the first type. But no, but after, so they get the, the type, right? So we're going to, it's the static, so we're going to do that. We're going to, you know, basically run an auction for a, a commitment to a sequence of programs after. Right. But so I could, I could extract everything then, right? I could basically, I don't have to do this dynamically. Okay, so that's right, that's right. That's exactly, in the complete monitoring setting, you can extract everything right after they make their first report. And in that case, it's optimal. So would it be, yeah. I'm trying to think if there's a way, if one way of characterizing the wedge is to say between the complete monitoring, you know, when I can use the relaxation and when I can't, right. is to say that my optimal program could be one in which I extract everything at the first period. In other words, the example you just gave me is in period two, uh, I, I wanted to wait until period two. Yeah, no, ex except, uh, except uh, we're going to have it work when uh, the optimal program doesn't extract everything. You can still get it to work out because uh, because theta isn't known, and we're going to have settings that works where the agent actually has utility. And this is the point. Mm -hmm. uh, you, so we'll see that when we actually get to the allocation, because uh, right in this, like this quick example, theta is unknown, and... Uh, yeah, well, let me, let me, uh, can we go back to the previous slide? So sure. let me just try to understand this, this example. So in this example, yeah. uh, it's the a cool example. monitoring example, I'm going to charge the value in the second period. Yeah. So I don't want to... I don't, if I, in a complete monetary environment, I don't want to uh, agree to allocate, to commit to an allocation at period one. Exactly, that's right. Not, exactly, so that's right. Okay, that's right. So, so is it enough to say then that this approach is going to work uh, in exactly those cases in which, uh, you know, if I, if I wrote down the complete monetary program, I could solve everything at period one? So we don't, I don't believe that. Uh, we should definitely t chat about this offline because we've been struggling with this because somehow the way all these static, these envelope theorems work really are c derivations in the complete monitoring setting and we really don't understand when it works out. We have all these examples which are kind of crazy yeah. and this example, like Hamid came up with it and we're like, wow, this is so simple and it shows this approach can't possibly work and it almost shows that we know nothing about optimal mechanism de design because uh, the settings that works, we're in this crazy setting, we're extracting everything. So it'd be a really, I mean, okay. it, so let's get back to that. But, but isn't the heart of this example and, and the relationship with the complete modern solution uh, that in this, in this particular example, the principal and the seller has no control whatsoever over whether or not the agent receives that second signal. So you look at, you know, essentially, that's the contribution of uh, uh, SO and They don't give that example. They don't give they the counterexample. Counter and their counterexample is wrong, too. We, we know that their counterexample is wrong. <laughs> the, the, the math, they, they screwed up some math. But, 
the, the key, the key <laughs> thing, though, is... So, so I guess, yeah, kind of things that are done and not correct. That's <laughs> the, 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 the contribution. <laughs> but so, uh, the, key, the, key, the key insight there is that if you can control when the guy receives information, so we can have these examples. You can suck up all the information rents. And here, you don't have that control. The agent is always going to receive that second signal. We can do examples like this even in, we can do examples where it breaks even in the bandit setting. Where you're receiving signals only conditional on an action made by the principal in the initial period. Yeah, I believe that's the case. I would be, I would be very surprised. Because maybe <laughs> offline, let's. Yeah, because has some, uh, some conditions. Let, let, let's go to that discussion yeah. offline. Because I think it's a, it's a very interesting point, understanding when this works out. But the point is, we do know when this works. We have this notion of revenue equivalence. And now the question is, how the heck do we salvage this? Uh, because, and the way to do it is we're going to need structural assumptions on the environment uh, for when it works. Because without these assumptions, we don't expect it to work in general. So now let's look at these assumptions. Uh, and in a sense, we did this backward. We figured out the assumptions uh, that would make it work, and only later we realized somehow they're necessary. OK, so, the, so it's going to work in environments which we call separable. OK, so the, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assume the first signal theta is statistically independent of all future signals. Because what was kind of breaking in that last example was this correlation. So let's just make it independent uh, and it's somewhat reasonable because we're thinking in the ad action case we're thinking of theta as the profit and uh, the experiences as these click-through rates. So we're assuming uh, these are independent statistically. For notational convenience, let's let EI and row I be the I's current public and private experience. Okay? And somehow just having independence of the signals uh, we don't think is enough. We somehow need the value functions to also have a certain separation. And there's two natural forms of separation to consider. One is a multiplicatively separable function, which is the, the way the value uh, function looks. Is it's a function of, the, pr of the, the initial type times a function of the future experience. And this works for the ad auction case, where it's a profit times uh, the chance of, of getting a purchase, because we can wrap up these things into B. Uh, and this thing, A of theta, is just theta. So this b function B is just whatever the Bayesian posterior works out to be for these, these rates. And the nice thing is this function B uh, takes in experiences. So these experiences can be uh, in any signal space. They don't have to be real signals. Uh, so that's kind of one big conceptual improvement over the previous work is we can have these subsequent signals really being uh, just in some arbitrary set as opposed to real valued signals. So, so for example, the experience could be just a history of, of uh, binary clicks and whether or not purchase decisions and occur. Oh, so, well, there's just a couple examples, uh, positive examples, that you could work things out in like autoregressive models where what happens is you just get a real number from a Gaussian being added. Uh, so we can also handle values that are additively separable, where the way that the value function looks is it's a sum of a function of the first signal plus a sum of the function of the subsequent experience. And we can have the public experience depend on both of them. And this type of model is natural for things like when your values drift over time. You can capture things like autoregressive models. I'm not going to go into the details of this, but basically you can capture natural notions of when, mm -hmm. uh, when uh, the values drift. And the point here is that uh, we're, we're getting both a statistical and a functional separation between the initial signals and the future types. Because that kind of trivial example showed that we wanted some sort of statistical separation. Uh, but somehow, at least as far as we can tell, we need a notion of functional separation that respects that statistical separation. And this is the natural, uh, there's two types of ways to get that functional separation. So, so um, do you have counterexamples when you have statistical but not functional separation? Uh, no, we're still in this process of trying to figure out. Uh, we're still trying to digest. Uh, okay, maybe Hamid has. No, no, no. That, that's on the assumptions of the. the so, so what I was asking is that if it is statistically separable, so that you get out of the counter right. example on the last page. That's right. But it's not functionally separable, either multiplicatively or that's additively. Right. Um, do you have counter examples? Not 
Okay, so, so uh, in the next slide. Uh, That's what I, I right. mean, it's, it's very natural. And it happens in cases where that's right, that's cares right. about. That's right. However, I'm just wondering, is it, you know, no, that's I'm right. It's a, is it necessary? That's all. That's right. That's, a, that's exactly the question we've been banging our heads against trying. Because okay. it's unclear what the right way to make that statement is. I think Jeff is what's it. All we, can, all we have right now is examples where, oh, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. Right. Uh, is there a general way to say, this is all, you know, some more general way to work just, yeah. just by saying, if we don't have this, we can't do it. But uh, but we have a partial answer to that question. So what we have for our, now we can say our main theorem now is that under some natural assumptions on these functions, so for the multiplicative case, all we need is this function A is to be log concave, and B just has to be positive. So B being positive is very, very weak, and A being log concave is just a natural uh, setting. And then for the additive case, A just has to be concave in theta. And the assumptions we need on F are really exactly the same conditions Meyerson needs. Uh, it's basically a certain type of sure. log and concavity. If that wasn't true, then that wasn't true so Myerson uh, is not even going to work. Too, so That's right. Uh, so under these assumptions, uh, we can have our main theorem now that for separable environments, uh, we're gonna, we can provide an optimal mechanism, which we call the virtual index mechanism. And for these environments, we have this particular revenue equivalence, where what we have is that the optimal dynamic revenue equals the, the optimal complete monitoring revenue. Uh, for these environments. So no information rent is being paid uh, for these types of environments. And in response to Greg, we'll, in these environments, agents will also have utility. So it won't be the case uh, that, uh, right. The first period, yeah. So, so we'll see that ex actually exactly, uh, it'll become obvious in a second when we uh, look at uh, the way the proof works. So now we're going to look at uh, how we go about this, solving this problem. It's going to be a little more mathematical now, but uh, hopefully the notation isn't too bad. So for a moment now, let's just ignore incentives and look at the problem of maximizing the revenue when people are truthful. Okay? So, so VIT is going to be the value of agent I at time t. QIT is going to be the allocation rule, whether or not we allocate at time t. And uh, our revenue is just going to be the discounted sum of these, because we're assuming if we give it to someone, we get their value. Okay? And uh, for the main of the talk, let's just look at the advertising case where we look at this multiplicative case. And we look at the easier case when V is really theta times B. Uh, so the revenue we can write in this way, which is just the sum over theta times these uh, things. And um, here, since we aren't taking uh, any incentives into account, the Giddens policy is optimal. And so GIT is just going to be the Giddens index of agent I at time T. Uh, we just select the arm with the highest Giddens index and pull that. Okay? Now, this isn't going to work uh, in the dynamic setting because I, I completely ignored incentives. But looking at this program is going to give us intuition as to what's going to happen in the, the dynamic case. Okay, so now we actually can look at the structure of this relaxed program from um, Milgram and Segal. So what we have in the complete monitoring setting, uh, we can write down what the envelope condition implies. And what we have magically is we can say that the revenue, if the mechanism is IC and IR, you can say that uh, the revenue it's going to obtain an expectation is going to be, uh, instead of having this value theta here, like we did before, it turns out to be the virtual value of theta, uh, which is kind of what we were trying to get at before, where we said, uh, we just want to kind of replace the values with the virtual values and do a Gittins mechanism on that. So here's the program now. We know, whoops. Uh, so we, uh, okay. so here's the program now. We've imposed the IC constraint, and what's happened due to the structure is we've just replaced theta by the virtual value of theta. And, uh, and now it's easy to figure out uh, what this conjectured allocation is in this relaxed program, which is just to run uh, Gittins on this virtual surplus. So now instead of maximizing uh, the values, we're, rep we're maximizing the virtual values. So all we're doing is, uh, in this click model, is we're replacing the profit they get with the virtual profit and maximizing that beast. Okay? So, so, so now let's look at the next trick. So in a sense, this is just how we come up with the allocation. But what's surprising is we can actually relate this to VCG. Um, so this is going to be the most math you're going to see. So I'm just rewriting that expression where the profit is just the sum over i, the virtual 
value times the sum of these delta t's, the allocation, and whether or not the purchase occurs is what these b's are. So let's just divide by theta and multiply by theta. So if you multiply this theta by b, uh, that's just the value. So now the fact that it's um, product form is... Important. That's right. Now the fact that no, we're using the, 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 the functional separation here. And this beast here, we're going to define as the virtual ratio. So this piece is the ratio of the virtual value to the value. And now what's going on is to maximize this, you really just scale the Gittins index by the virtual ratio. So that's the policy. It's just like the old policy. Um, OK, but in a sense, whatever. This is just another way to write it. But the kind of very interesting thing about this functional form, any guesses as to what this thing looks like? So if I didn't have this piece here, what would this thing be? Social. Well, it, it, well, this revenue would actually be the social welfare. Uh, so with this thing here, so it's the observation now uh, is that we're going to use for, for pricing this thing is that um, if we fix this data, this thing is just a different weighting scheme on the social welfare function. Right? So, so now people are starting to click with moving social welfare, so but the point is... That's right. It's coming from the fact that you were able to have it multiplicative. That's right. That's right. Because of the multi, and we can do something very similar in the additive case yeah, too. I'm, I'm trying uh, to figure out what you're going to do. Okay. Right. Right. So, so this, right. So, so, so this is where the having lifting occurs. Right. So, if we actually knew theta, if this guy was fixed. Yeah. Uh, this is just a, a VCG problem. Uh, but the point is, now we can figure out what to do for all future time periods, right? So the point is. Uh, let them report some theta at the beginning. Uh, and then whatever they report, we just plug that in here. And, but from then on, this is a social welfare problem. So we can basically use the VCG prices for t greater than 1. Mm -hmm. So in particular, the way this will work out is at the beginning, you have people rep make some report b of their initial type. Mm -hmm. Whatever b they use, just replace that, virtual, that weighting function and replace it with b. And then we're just going to run the dynamic VCG because, uh, because of the structure of that function, we basically said what the mechanism doing is it's effectively implementing uh, a VCG. Uh, it's effectively implementing a dynamic VCG uh, mechanism. And the point being is that uh, for T greater than 1, we basically get IC and IR for free in that it's an easy extension of these guys' work because because uh, we're just fixing these weights, and then we're going to run the mechanism, uh, the VCG mechanism, which is implementing exactly the same allocation rule, uh, but we just know how to charge because uh, it, it's a VCG cost function. So basically, it's this reduction that for the, we can show that the, the right mechanism is behaving like a mechanism, this VCG mechanism, and this VCG mechanism, we know how to charge. Now, if it's additive rather than multiplicative, do you get a VCG? Yeah, we get a different uh, a affine different transformation. Rates. Yeah, we actually get an additive shift. Uh, so and then... Uh, I have private information that in five years I want to retire, so I actually don't want to run up to time infinity. That's then a different I, can of worms. Then I can sort of... And you don't know that, so then I, it, I might have incentives to cheat. To yeah, there's a different can of worms when the prior is misspecified. So, so we're not even going to go into that direction because uh, everything is with respect to optimal with respect to the prior. When the prior start getting misspecified, so it's we not. always assume everybody will win the game forever. Uh, well, we could assume that they might get to a state when they no longer have utility, so we drop them out. Sure. So, but if if somehow we can't represent that in our prior, then couldn't the prior say, "Well, there's a chance for strong retirement"? Yeah, that's right. That's right. If you can re represent in the, in your prior, then then that's fine. But you, it might not be possible to represent at a particular time uh, at a particular time step in an absolute time step. You might have a transition probability to get to that state, uh, and then... Also, but you retire in five years, Christian? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm saying it's sort of... But it's sort of one... Christian, it's a joke. Go on. Okay. No, the reason I'm asking <laughs> is... Very good. Is, the reason I'm asking is an economic one. When you... Sort of allo <laughs> I'm sure. When you, when you allocate sort of in this non-dynamic setting where you allocate for... Forever, one of the criticisms is that you never can really get commitment forever. 
So this idea of buying the firm only works if you really... Now somebody gave a talk about that. Who was that? Was that Larry yeah, or somebody? Yeah. Was that Larry gave a talk on that? Right, this business that you can't commit for. Yeah. Now one thing about this ad auction, so in one day you're allocating millions of queries, right? So this infinite actually happens in the course of a day or week. <laughs> okay, but anyway. Internet time. Uh, okay, so the idea now is you know, we're trying to find some mechanism to, to implement this allocation rule. We're trying to find some pricing rule to implement this uh, allocation rule. And we do that with this reduction to VCG, uh, at least for T greater than 1. So the real problem now is we've boiled everything down to a problem of what do we do at the first time step? So what about payments and verifying incentive compatibility at the first time step? Because we know how to charge later on because uh, we're just setting things up as uh, what's really going is just maximizing social welfare. And the question, but the key point is that uh, we have some understanding of the off equilibrium behavior. So if I lie at time step one, uh, I'm definitely going to have a different weight here in my social welfare function. But the point is, the VCG mechanism is, is uh, IC for any weighting scheme. So even if I lie at time step one, uh, I know I'm going to be truthful in the future. We allow re-reports for, for technical reasons. Uh, but the point is, even if you lie at time step one, uh, you're changing your, your weighting scheme, but it's truthful thereafter because the VCG works for any uh, weighting scheme. So we know what happens. Uh, we can characterize the off equilibrium behavior at time step one. And now we just have to just turn the crank and say and verify IC explicitly at time step one because we have to ask the question, uh, if I lie at time step one, we know I'm going to be truthful from thereafter. And now the question is, could I make more money by doing this? And this, in a sense, is really the heart of the proof. Uh, so this is kind of uh, uh, really the last slide here, uh, that in a sense I've built everything up to really the hard part of the proof. The rest was just tricks and manipulations, and there's really only one part of the proof that has meat to it. The rest is just kind of these mathematical manipulations. It's verifying uh, IC at time step one. And this is kind of delicate because what we need to verify is I'm going to lie at time step one, and, and I know what I'm going to do in the future. I'm going to be truthful. And now we just have to see that I'm going to have less utility if I do this. And there's a number of uh, techniques we use here. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to couple these two uh, processes. So we're going to think about sampling one long set of experiences, both public and private. And we're going to ask the question, we're going to look what happens when I'm truthful on this set and we're going to look what happens on this path and we're going to look at what happens if I deviate on this path. Okay, so, so we basically uh, uh, couple the paths and we're going to try to figure out what happens when we deviate on this path and here's where the bandit nature helps because we have two coupled paths we know the arm only advances when we pull it. So we can try to keep track of what would have happened had I done something else because it's like this automata. It only advances uh, when I pull it so it's so we're really exploiting the bandit property in this coupling argument. So that's the first idea we use. And then we use what are known as these envelope theorems because we want to understand what happens uh, when I deviate uh, on this path, to my, uh, what happens to my utility. And the basic point is we use these theorems to roughly show that uh, if you end up delaying the times, by which you, the times that when you get allocated, this is only going to decrease your utility. So, uh, so we basically, because of the di discount factor, I really want to get the, uh, the item sooner. Uh, and sure, this has to do with you know, prices and so on, but these envelope theorems basically tell you the differences in utility. So you can look at the difference in utility. And roughly speaking, if you end up delaying the allocation times, you end up decreasing utility. Okay. So now the, the final part of this proof is really the stochastic dominance argument, that if you lie at the first period, uh, and say you decrease your first bid, you can actually show that the top allocation in this lying sample path is going to occur at a later point in time than had you been honest. So, so on every path, you have this stochastic dominance in these allocation times. Uh, and you can basically show that in, uh, in this coupling argument. And we're really using these particular monoticity properties here uh, when we're, we're doing this. But you can kind of... Uh, you know, it's really this automata, and we can kind of keep track of these two things, but this 
automata, this bandit property makes it very easy to keep track of these two things, and then you really just grind the crank and you do this inductive proof to show that, uh, um, to show that you'll, so, so in, in a sense, I can give you some intuition for this, uh, why this is the case. So at time step one, you can see you're gonna be allocated at a later point in time, because if you bid lower at the first round, what ends up happening is you end up decreasing your weight. If you end up decreasing your weight, the VCG mechanism doesn't wanna allocate to you as much, so the first allocation will occur at a later point in time, and then you can kind of do an inductive proof and show that every allocation will occur at a later point in time. Uh, and that's kind of the heart of the proof, and that shows IC, and then IR you just get for free, you just kind of charge, right. So, uh, so, so we really utilized a number of these techniques in this proof, and this is really the, the core idea, and I'm not gonna go into any of the details here. Okay, so, so the summary is as follows. So we really presented this virtual index mechanism, which worked for this natural class of separable environments, and we argued that uh, we might need assumptions for something like this to work because we're really in this setting where agents aren't enjoying these dynamic information rents. They aren't getting any more utility for having private experience. Um, and one of the tricks we use is this, this relation to VCG. Because of the structure of our functions, we're really able to use the knowledge we have of, of VCG uh, to do the heavy lifting in our proofs. And uh, there's a couple, uh, there's a number of interesting future directions which uh, one of which uh, I'm very interested to talk about, which is optimality in more general settings. So somehow we really only have an understanding of, of this case when we don't have information rents because, and somehow getting past that, it's not even clear we have the right set of techniques because I think maybe you can do some notion of dynamic ironing and relax these uh, concavity-based assumptions, uh, but somehow the counterexample we show is, uh, is really that uh, the, the revenue equivalence doesn't hold. And my conjecture is ironing won't fix that. So somehow, uh, yeah, I don't even know the techniques you would use to try to address this problem, but trying to characterize this in a, uh, you know, when this revenue equivalence holds in a more crisp manner, I think is an interesting question. And of course, there's always the question that uh, non-economists are interested in, which is more non-Bayesian settings. Uh, I guess the economists are interested in the robust settings too. So what happens if your priors are misspecified, uh, or, you know, there's some undesirable properties of this mechanism in that uh, it's kind of like this contractual scheme where you might have to pay a lot at the beginning and this might be, uh, n this might not be, desi be desirable, you know, could you find a way that somehow a more periodic notion of, a more kind of instantaneous notion of IC that, that doesn't ask people to pay up front. Um, so wait, I saw you said before you didn't pay up front. Okay, so, so it, you, you don't necessarily pay up front, but, but this mechanism is trying to pull out as much as it can up front. It still has to, uh, it st still might have to charge you in the future, uh, but the point is somehow, if you don't get the experience, uh, I, you know, if I know you're gonna get the experience later on, the optimal mechanism is gonna try to charge you for it now. Uh, now, it might not be able to because uh, because of the, the details of, of the setting, but if certainly if you were the only agent in the system, it's really going to try to, you know, so, so, so if you look at, you know, we're still trying to get a feel as to what's going on in special cases, uh, because, you know, it, even in the cases we have, you aren't charging everything up front. You're definitely distributing the payments, but somehow, um, yeah. Uh, I yeah, the expectation is the same, but right. So, 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 but you can so, so you don't, so you can spread out that lump sum initial period payment. Right, right. Without changing any of the incentives. Yeah, but, but, but the point is, the, the, the revenue you're getting is pulling, is, is kind of pulling everything. That, that's really what I mean. Uh, but that's right. But it's like this. It's yeah, but, at the, but at the end of the day. But it's this. But it's like this unappealing thing that say you didn't have any information in the first period, you get your signal the second period. I charge you a half. Somehow this isn't particularly appealing, because uh, no one wants to. You know, if I'm in this thing, I'm gonna be like, I really don't want to pay this. Like somehow you're screwing me over, uh, and I'm not happy about this. Somehow you know, it's more of a conceptual problem as to how to write things down. I don't know what the. Didn't you just uh, think you can charge a half in arbitrary way over the future? You can, but you're still paying a half. <laughs> right. Yeah, so, uh, uh, right. So, 
So it's not, I mean, so you're upset about it, obviously. Yeah, I mean, we don't, I don't know how much I said about it, but certainly in this very simple cases, it's kind of nasty. Right. Uh, and depending on, I don't know how, I can quite understand exactly how it is the prior, but if you have a good prior or something, can you set it up in such a way that an advertiser, it would be fairly simple, like an advertiser would understand how they're going to be charged, or is it simple? Or you know, uh, I believe it's relatively simple for the, uh, for the Bernoulli case. I mean, we're still working, trying to work out the details, but I think the payment scheme isn't too bad for how they're charged. And certainly, um, I suspect the natural heuristics for how to think about this the, for how to do a more natural so uh, payment scheme. So what would be the natural heuristic charge? So I guess you would think about something like a Bernoulli prior and think about, um, I don't know if we've actually think of, thought about other, we've, we've been looking at the Bernoulli, a particular prior and trying to figure out uh, cleanly what that payment scheme looks like. Because it works out when things are Bernoulli and you can set up like. But I guess uh, the point is you can tell the advertisers that they, you know, all they have to do is be honest. Right, that's right. That's right. They don't have to speak. That's right. Only if they want to be. That's right. That's right. Over the system, uh, they have to. That's right. That's right. Think hard. Uh, that's right. You can so think of like setting this learning process as a service for them, so they can self-describe this learning process. Just be honest and do the calculation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Charging for the service. Right. Okay, let's. Thanks. Good.